Good morning, church family. Like Pastor Zach said, my name is Timothy Anderson, and I'm super humbled to be able to serve here as a student pastor here at Enon. Uh, those of you who've watched me grow up here, you know that it's moments like these where I kind of have to, to pinch myself. Because honestly, a dream that I get to be doing this at 22 years old, when just over a decade and a half ago, I was sitting right over here in one of these pews at one of the first ever VBSs held in this sanctuary. At that VBS, Jesus saved my life, and he's been changing my life ever since. For example, it wasn't until a few years later when I got serious about Jesus and his word outside the bounds of these walls and this campus. I started studying God's word chapter by chapter, and I love making lists. So I made a list of all the books in the Bible, and I began marking them off my list as I read them one by one. And I fell in love with the redemptive story of Scripture and the entire narrative of Scripture. But I found that I loved nothing more than going through the Gospels and looking at the life of Jesus. And we're going to be doing a little bit of that this morning. So we're going to be spending our time in the Gospel of Mark this morning, chapter 10. That's Mark chapter 10. If you would like to go ahead and turn there, you're welcome to do so. But like I said, I love going through the Gospels and looking at the life of Jesus. And many of you who have read the Gospels, or at the very least been to enough Sunday school classes or church services, and you understand this, you understand that there seems to be somewhat of a, a pattern and consistency when it comes to Jesus' encounters and conversations with people. Meaning this, whenever Jesus would teach or perform miracles, it always seems like the next passage of Scripture a majority of the time has something to do with somebody plotting to kill Jesus. And if it's not people trying to kill him, there are countless conversations that people approach Jesus with where the main point of the conversation is just to trip Jesus up so they could justify some sort of uh, wrongdoing or blasphemy so they could ultimately end his life. There are also several people that approach Jesus with needs like sick family members and desires, things that need to be broken free from. Don't get me wrong, Jesus came to earth to do these things, and I believe he even finds joy in these things, like healing and breaking earthly bondages. But if he came to this world just to heal people physically and to meet physical needs, and that was it, I believe if you were to even ask Jesus, he would even say, yes, I'm glad I healed those people. I'm glad I met those needs but I missed the entire purpose of why I came here in the first place. I came to heal people, not just physically, but spiritually and eternally. That's why Jesus came to this world in the first place, to heal people spiritually and eternally, to save people. We see this in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This verse in context isn't referring to an earthly saving but rather an eternal salvation. That's why Jesus came, to seek and save to eternal security. But why is that important? Why is that important within the, the lenses we're looking at this this morning? It's important because time and time again, people approach Jesus with things that weren't necessarily his main concern. Don't get me wrong, Jesus loves serving people, but he came for so much more than that at least more than the ways that people were desiring to be served. Because remember, his plan for salvation is the ultimate act of service. When we look at Jesus' ministry, a strong majority of the time, what people are seeking is not the main thing that Jesus came to give. It's something else. Like we talked about, it's physical needs, sometimes for themselves, sometimes for family members. And many conversations that Jesus had with people, they were just had so that they could trip Jesus up, try to kill him. So I would have to assume this has to be at least a little bit frustrating for Jesus. There's a couple passages that come to mind. That we're talking about one this morning that is a holy conversation in respect to all these other things that people approach Jesus with. This holy conversation that we're going to be looking at this morning is set apart because the conversation spark aligns perfectly with Jesus' mission. The conversation spark aligns perfectly with Jesus' mission. In Mark 10, 17, there's a young man that asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Sometimes you get bursts of excitement, right? 
I know we live in the South, so whenever those fall Saturdays are just around the corner, or maybe Friday night lights, we have this internal, almost uncontainable happiness about us. I think it roots from the excitement we have for whatever the upcoming event is. I have, the, I have the pleasure to be able to enjoy that fall feeling uh, almost year-round because I dabble in lots of other sports besides college football. But even right now, I'm less than a month away from getting married, so I have this abnormal excitement in me when I think about these things. With all that Jesus encounters in life, for meeting so many needs and having people try to trip him up constantly, I've got to assume that Jesus has a holy feeling inside of him. And that feeling would surpass any Iron Bowl Saturday or any wedding day. Because this is the King of Kings who for once has somebody approaching him with the question that he came to our world to answer. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The ultimate need that he came to meet. He came to save the lost, to bless humanity with the opportunity to inherit heaven. And all the conversations Jesus gets approached with, this one aligns perfectly with his ultimate mission. So you better believe these are going to be some of Jesus' home run words. Now let's be honest, I know that every verse in the Bible is a home run, especially those written in red. I just want to draw some extra attention to this as we dive in. Because like I said, this moment, somebody, somebody approached Jesus with a question he ultimately came to earth to answer. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And I get excited thinking about this. And those of you who appreciate Fall Saturdays, you know this. Those of you who love going to weddings or at least appreciated your own wedding, you know this. My fiance loves going to Disney World. And I, love we have, I know we have at least a few Disney World fans in the house this morning. And if you love Disney World, you know this. When you have these moments of excitement, we do our absolute best to try to make the most of them, don't we? Whenever I go to Jordan-Hare Stadium, I get there early, I leave late to make the most of my experience. Whenever my fiance Maddie goes to Disney World, she has an agenda and a list of things that she wants to do in order to make the most of her experience. A TV show called The Office, Jim and Pam, they get married. And on their wedding day, they make it a point to take mental pictures throughout the day so they can make the most of their experience. But when we talk about these experiences, I want us to remember how much this is magnified and amplified here. Because this is no game. This is no vacation. In the TV show, and it's much more important than a wedding, which I know for some brides brides it's impossible to comprehend that. But this is the king of the universe we're talking about here who finally gets a chance to explicitly answer the question he came to earth to solve. And if we can make the most out of Alabama versus Tennessee, and if we as humans can say and do all the right things to make the most out of worldly situations, I believe the Son of God can say and do all the right things to make the most out of this heavenly conversation, a holy conversation. With that being said, I really want to dive into some truths that Jesus communicates here in this holy conversation. Because again, I believe this moment is so important to Jesus as he is posed with the question he came to earth to answer. But before we dive in uh, to these truths that he shares, I want us to read this passage in its entirety. So I invite you all to stand as we reverence God's word together. And if you're unable to stand, like Zach always says, I would invite you to reverence God's word right there where you're at in your heart. Beginning in verse 17, going through 31, it says this. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. 
And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They are exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. God, we thank you for your goodness this morning. I pray we would see so much more of it this morning than we've already seen in life group and as we we come here to worship you this morning. I pray you continue to pour out your goodness on us. God, and as a result of meeting here today, that we'd be able to live in that goodness as as you've called us to do. God, I pray you limit anything that I've got to say but maximize everything that you want to say so that we might look just a little bit more like Jesus and pursue him just a little bit more as a result of us being together today. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So the first thing that we see that Jesus does here in this passage, we see this in verses 18 through 20, we see that he gauges true goodness. He gauges true goodness. Jesus asked this young man, why do you call me good? Because remember, this young man referred to Jesus as good teacher. Jesus asked, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That's what Jesus says here. What goes through your mind when you hear that? For me, I remember the first time I heard this story. Of course, when I was really young, it went in one ear and out the other. But when I was able to begin comprehending this story in my later years in children's ministry, in my early years in student ministry, I was always confused by this a little bit. Even on surface level, this this can still be confusing to me. And many of you might be in a similar mindset in this. Because why would Jesus question why this young man would call him good, only to point to God being the only good being, when in reality Jesus is God, of the same person? I'll repeat that one more time because I know that's wordy. Why does Jesus question why this young man would call him good, only to point to God being the only good being, when in reality Jesus is is God. Jesus is God. That's the key. Because for us in this place, many of us in this room, we believe that. Even if it's just intellectually, we have a sense that, yes, the same Jesus that we're reading about here played a role in creation. The same Jesus we're reading about here is still on the throne today holding the universe together. Whether we live like he's king is a different story. Whether we have a personal relationship with him is a different conversation as well. But here in Morris, Alabama, even just theologically speaking, we can wrap our minds around the incarnation. The truth that God became human. In one word, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus. But this young man that Jesus was encountering did not have the divinity of Jesus on the forefront of his mind much less in his mind at all. How do we know this? He approaches Jesus and calls him good teacher. I mean, you probably have a similar reaction and say, I mean, yeah, he's a good teacher, but he's also the God of the universe. Good teacher is kind of an understatement there. So we know that if he's calling Jesus good teacher without the realization of his divinity, And he probably has an incorrect view of what good and bad are. So this is why Jesus is ultimately gauging what true goodness is here in this passage. Because all of humanity has fallen short of the glory of God. Just like Romans tells us. It's not about doing more good than bad or all bad. Now I'll say this. If you have a friend of yours and you say, yeah man, he's he's a good guy. Or she's a good girl. Does that mean you're going to hell? No. Does that even count as sin? Probably not. It's all about proper context. And in this context, remember, 
He's approaching Jesus with the question that he came to earth to answer and the problem that he came to earth to solve. So Jesus is using his words very carefully so that the truth would be enlightened in this conversation. Because this young man needs to understand that no one is good. Because then and only then can he understand that he needs to accept the grace that God offers. That Jesus would give his life up on the cross. That Jesus would ultimately give his life as a sacrifice for this young man. But without this truth, this young man would say, that's great, but I'm good already. I'm good on my own, so I'm good to get to heaven. So Jesus has this, in our perspective, this, this weird diction to show this young man the unseen need he has for grace in his life, which ultimately helps him gauge what true goodness is. I also love in verse 19 how Jesus lays down the old law as he continues to gauge what true goodness is. He goes through all these things, and the young man communicates that he never murdered anybody, he never committed adultery, never stole anything, never bore false witness, and that he honored his parents. And sometimes we just mentally dismiss the fact that he actually kept these laws. But here's the deal. Probably even some of you in this room will be perfect if we used a specific standard like this one. Never committed adultery, never stole, never bore false witness in a legal setting. Honoring your parents is a tough one, but let's just say you do that one well. And then not murdering somebody is on here. No, statistically, most of us have that one down pat. Some of you might have all these boxes checked, at least most of them. So the fact that this young man actually kept these things perfect is not completely outside the realm of possibility, but so often we just dismiss that. So let's just say that he does. Let's say that he's kept all these laws as we listed perfectly so we can make sure all of our bases are touched here at the very least. Because the lazy thing for us to do as we uh, study God's word here would just to be to assume that he cheated on his wife or that he stole money or lied in a legal setting or was a jerk to his parents. And if he's innocent on all those, we can just assume that he murdered somebody. That's the lazy thing for us to do. But what if this young man was telling the truth about keeping these commandments? Can he attain eternal life? What does Jesus say earlier in his ministry about these laws? Matthew 5, 21, 22 say this. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Amen. We're good on that, and this young man's probably good on that as well. But here's what verse 22 says. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Maybe we've never committed adultery. But Jesus says this earlier in his ministry. But I say to you, everyone who looks at somebody with lustful intent has already committed adultery with them in their heart. Maybe you've never lied in a legal setting. You ever told a lie before at all? Even just one? Jesus, time and time again, preaches that it takes perfection to get to heaven, not just with works and with actions, but with words and thoughts as well. And we sit here and then we ask, then how do we attain eternal life? If it takes perfection to get into heaven, then how do we get into heaven? Jesus. That's it. As we figure out how to gauge what true goodness is, true goodness can only come from Jesus. It's impossible for us to truly be good. What a great reminder this is, that we are not truly good. It's impossible for us to be truly good. We don't get into heaven based on our goodness, but on Jesus' goodness, his perfection, and the allegiance we pledge to him. So the first thing that Jesus does is he gauges what true goodness is by laying down the old law and communicating that the only good being is God. The next thing Jesus does is he commands 100% commitment. He commands 100% commitment. We see this in verses 21 and 22 here. Jesus communicates that no one can truly be good, then he commands commitment. And this is nothing 
foreign to scripture or God's story. We see this commitment commanded in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. But Mark 10, 21, Jesus does say this specifically to this young man. He says, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. Whenever we, say, whenever we have students who say yes to following Jesus, which, by the way, we set out a goal in 2023 to see a dozen students come to know Jesus this year, We've already seen God work in awesome ways. We're already uh, beyond halfway as we sit here in May on that goal. So praise Jesus for that. But whenever we have students who say yes to following Jesus, I have a specific follow-up process that, that I've used for a long time. And I believe this to be biblical and can even draw truths back to the specific story we're discussing this morning. I always like to know students and really anyone's comprehension of their decision and commitment to their decision. Comprehension and commitment. I'll ask them in your own words, like ask Nico this whenever he gave his life to Jesus, and anyone that gives life to Jesus, ask these questions. In your own words, what decision did you make? Then I ask them, why is this decision important? That's the comprehension part. Then I like to figure out what their commitment level is. One of the questions I ask is, if you had to give up all your possessions to follow Jesus, Would you? If you had to give up all your possessions to follow Jesus, would you? Nico said it'd be hard, but he would. Here's the deal, church. Christianity is not legalism. There are not works that you must do to enter heaven. We've already been over how imperfect we are and how we are not truly good at all But at the same time, we should have godly desires. We should be making efforts to do right things and to abstain from wrong things. And I would even say this morning, if you feel zero conviction in your soul and in your life for the wrong things that you do or for the right things that you don't do, I might just stop you right there and say, chances are you don't know Jesus. And like I said, this is no no legalism. All it takes to enter heaven is A, B, and C. I learned this at VBS, and to this day, it's my favorite evangelism tool. A, we admit. We admit that we have sinned, that we've done wrong, that we cannot get to heaven on our own because it takes perfection to get into heaven, and we are not that. We admit that. B is believe. We believe that Jesus is God, that he is perfect, and he lived the perfect life here on earth, took God's wrath on himself, and died in our place. And came back to life three days later, proving his divinity. I believe we have A and B down pat here. I believe in my heart of hearts, there's a good chance every person in this room believes that A is true. I would assume most would believe B, but I think C is where we might struggle a little bit. Let me explain why. C is we confess. We confess Jesus as king of our life. Again, Christianity is not legalism. It's not about adding up good and bad and who gives up what for Jesus. But it is about a level of commitment. If Jesus was standing right here asking you to give up all your possessions, like right here, and he physically asked you, I need need you to give up all your possessions to follow me. If he were to ask you that right now, what would you say? If you say anything but yes, you don't really have him as king of your life. I think it would be a good exercise right now for us to ask ourselves, if Jesus asked me to give up everything to follow him, what would be some of the things that I'd be afraid to give up? Maybe it's a home, your car, job, family. These things are good things, most of which are pure blessings from God. But it all has to be on the table for the king. That's how kingsmanship works. So Jesus commands 100% commitment. 
as he should. He is God. He is king. He deserves it. This young man was not able to commit. Are we able to commit this morning? And if you're not all in at this moment, and I pray that you would be by the end of our passage this morning. The next point we see in this passage is that he informs the impossibility. He informs the impossibility. We see this in verses 23 through 27. If there's a point that makes me want to be all in for Jesus, if there's one thing that would make me react the opposite way that the rich young ruler did, it will be this. Jesus informs the impossibility. And the rich young ruler had actually left by this point, but praise God, we're still here to be able to read his word together this morning. And his disciples were also there, <clears throat> being able to listen to this truth that he claims in March, uh, Mark 10, 27. It says this, Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. As we read previously, this verse in context is referring to salvation. And we know this already, but I want to remind us that our goodness didn't save us. We talked about earlier how no one is truly good anyways. I want us to understand this as well. We talked about how Jesus commands commitment. Our commitment to him is not what's at the origin of our salvation either. Our intellectual belief and understanding with our human minds when it comes to believing that Jesus is God, that's not what's at the core of our salvation. What does it say about salvation with man? It is impossible. It's not about our goodness or commitment or our belief. Can't do it on our own. The good news of the gospel is that there's not a period at the end of this statement. but There's a comma. With man, it is impossible, comma, but not with God. God makes the impossible possible. It wasn't about our goodness. It wasn't about our so-called commitment. It's not even about our, our love for him, but rather it's about his love for us first and foremost. It's all about him. I would even say, church, predestination is a scary word for us sometimes, but it's a truth of the Bible. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 says this, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he what? He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. I believe God is more sovereign than we sometimes give him credit for. Now, within his sovereignty, I do believe he does give his people a chance to choose him. However, we must remember above all else, Above all else, the truth that Jesus communicates here in verse 27. With man, it is impossible. Jesus even goes as far to use an example of a camel going through the eye of a needle, which some pastors believe this is actually referring to a narrow doorway in Jerusalem, which has some good application to it. However, biblically, this is likely referring to a literal eye of a, of a needle, which means that it's not just difficult for that camel to go through that doorway, it is physically impossible for that camel to go through the literal eye of the needle. With man, it is impossible. We can't understand, we can't even understand the gospel until God's spirit enlightens us to it. We can't choose to follow Jesus without his leading first and foremost. We can't even love God on our own to any effectiveness until we're first loved by him. In order to fully appreciate the gospel the way that we should, and we talk about this a lot here, and I preach this to our students all the time, but the gospel isn't just for lost people to attain salvation, but it's for saved people to meditate on as we pursue sanctification. In order for us to receive maximum impact towards sanctification through meditation of the truth of the gospel, I believe we should truly dwell on the impossibility of salvation from humanity's perspective. The last thing I want us to touch on is how we see that Jesus normalizes not having it all. 
He normalizes not having it all. And I know for some of us, this can ruffle some feathers a little bit, especially for our younger audience. And I know I'm a part of that younger audience. But I've noticed this in my own life and as I've, I've heard wisdom from people older than me. The longer that you live, the more you realize having it all is more of a, more of a dream than a reality. Meaning this, everything requires a sacrifice. And everything we do and every decision that we make and all things we must weigh the pros and the cons, choosing what's best, knowing that we're missing out on something in the process. For example, me and my fiance were talking through this the other day. Uh, she goes to the University of Alabama, and next semester she begins taking her classes online. What we did not know is that if we switch to online school, she would lose her scholarship. So we had a decision to make. Do we want to find a different way to pay for school? Or have to commute to Tuscaloosa multiple times a week. Definitely pros and cons to both of these situations. So what Jesus does here at the end of this passage is he normalizes this. Not in an earthly way like the example that I gave, but in a heavenly way. Verses 29 to 31 say this. Peter began to say to him, see we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or, ch- or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This shows us that the expectation for believers is that we would sacrifice for the gospel. We see this echo in the book of Romans as well. Romans 12, 2 says this, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a what? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I love communicating this with our students, that this worship we get to be a part of on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights, and on Tuesday nights with our college and grads, like this is, this is not just a once a week thing. It's just an overflow of what we're doing with the rest of our life. And that is a living sacrifice. I want you to know that sacrifice is not a prerequisite for salvation. But rather it should be a motivation that should flow from salvation. Sacrifice is not something that's required to get saved or attain eternal life, but upon receiving this free gift of salvation, it should be a motivation of ours to sacrifice things. We should be motivated to sacrifice things in this world so that eternity might be impacted for the kingdom of God. Meaning this, that if you have a family member or a friend and you're scared to bring up Jesus to him because you might lose that relationship, it means that you sacrifice that. You sacrifice potentially losing that relationship so that they might accept Jesus. It means that you potentially sacrifice a secure career in the States to live overseas to advance God's kingdom if that's what he's calling you to do. It means that you sacrifice social status or even a potential promotion at your job or being looked down on at your school's because speaking about Jesus might be frowned upon. All in all, I love the holiness of this conversation. So this morning, if my preaching didn't necessarily resonate with you, that's okay. I pray that you would remember the importance of this conversation and allow that in of itself to resonate with you. That this conversation, above several other encounters that Jesus made with people, we should look extra careful at and truly meditate on Because the question that Jesus gets asked here lines up perfectly with what he ultimately came to accomplish. I always make sure to give a big idea each week to our students. Uh, It's just kind of in my rhythm of preaching at this point. So it doesn't matter if I've got three points or 13 points or 22 points. I will always make sure to leave you with one big idea. Because if you're like me, once you get to Cracker Barrel after church, uh, if you can remember one thing from the sermon, you're doing a pretty good job. And that's not just you, Zach. It's been my whole life, I promise. 
It's hard for me to remember more than one thing without referring back to my notes. My whole life I've been that way. So our big idea this morning, remember one thing and remember this. Our big idea this morning is that Jesus communicates in this holy conversation. What does he communicate? Salvation is impossible for us, but made possible by God. And our response to this salvation should be commitment and sacrifice. Salvation is impossible for us, but made possible by God. And our response to this salvation should be commitment and sacrifice. I'm going to invite our instrumentalist, Nicole, and come back up here. I'm going to pray over us, and then Pastor Zach's going to come and lead us in this response time. God, thank you so much. God, I think about your, your power, your majesty, and how you just spoke and created everything. You said, hey, Pacific Ocean, just stop right there. You're so powerful, and you choose to use that power not for evil, but for good. God, thank you so much for your goodness this morning. God, thank you for holy conversations like this one that communicate that we can't be good and you're the only good being and the only way we can attain salvation and eternal life with you is not through our goodness but through the goodness of your son and our allegiance to him. God, even in this, I thank you for calling us to commit. God, that humbles me this morning that you look down on a people who are not truly good but you still desire their commitment to you not perfectly but faithfully I pray if there's anyone here this morning who has never made this decision to follow you that they would do that this morning I pray for the folks here who you have graciously saved but God they strayed off the commitment path a little bit God, that today will be the day they would recommit their life to you. God, I also pray for people who are here this morning who know you, who are committed to you. God, that you would enlighten us to things that we need to sacrifice. That we would look at our, our lives, take an inventory of our schedule and think of things that we spend our time, money, and thoughts on that don't glorify you and either alter what we're doing in those things to bring glory to your name, we would just make that sacrifice and just drop them right here this morning. And in this response time, I pray we would worship you well, that you would be pleased by what you hear. God, help us make much of Jesus in this moment and as we go about our weeks this week. To his name we pray, amen. Church family, can we give Brother Timothy a big hand, man? Thank him for doing such a great job. It's his first time to preach on a Sunday morning here at Eden Baptist Church, man. You just you had coherent thoughts and great, and hey, I promise you that was better than I did at 22. So, uh, you know, church, let me say this: uh, I love this passage. Uh, I remember hearing a sermon preached about the rich young ruler one time that the points were the man had the right question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He came to the right person in Jesus, but he had the wrong response. And the Bible says he went away sadly because he was one who owned much property. I want you to know this morning that if you're curious, if, you're, if you don't know where you would spend eternity today, Jesus is the answer. And I promise you, that no matter what you have in this world that you think is worth hanging on to other than Jesus, it will pale in comparison for all eternity than to knowing Jesus and finding grace and mercy in Him. And so this morning, if you don't personally know Jesus, I beg you by the mercies of God, receive Him right there where you are. Receive Him. John chapter 1, as many as received Him, to those He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believed upon His name. This morning, if you'll just say, Jesus, I give you everything. Some of you have been holding on maybe to a lot, and you've yet to fully surrender your life to Jesus. If you are sensing God's drawing in your heart, and that is Him saying, come, come to me. Or maybe you do know Him as a Savior, but you haven't, you've drifted from Him. Maybe today, He's calling you back afresh and anew. Someone invites you all over this room. Maybe bow your heads, close your eyes just for a moment. 
And if you need to fully give your life to Jesus, the Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Maybe you'd pray a very simple prayer like this to Jesus. From your heart, would you say, Jesus, save me. I give my life to you. Save me. Is that you this morning? If you ask Jesus to save you with every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around, I just want to ask you, if, if you ask Jesus to save you, very just between you and I, would you just glance up at me right there where you are? Amen. Say, others in this room, you say, Pastor Zach, that's me. I asked Jesus to save me this morning. Would you just look up and keep your eyes on me just here for a moment? I just want to acknowledge you right there where you are. So I'm going to tell you, if you truly ask Jesus to save you this morning, in the days ahead, we want to help you walk in that decision. So take that card out of the seat back in front of you. Mark, I gave my life to Jesus on there. Come forward here in the next few moments. Let one of our pastors pray for you. Or maybe you can even come and see me at the conclusion of the service. Church members, as we sing this song of conclusion, if we need to freshly commit to the Lord today, to go all in, then do that right there where you are as you respond to the Lord. Let's stand together. Brother Ken, would you lead us? Our pastor's up front. If you need to join this church, you feel free to come. If you need somebody to pray for you, you feel free to come.